Good morning, and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. As most of you know, this week I'm going to be doing part two of our collaborative work with To The Future, something I'm very excited about and honored to be a part of. But that's not what I'm doing right now. I'm doing a video to commemorate the fact that this channel has just hit and exceeded 2,000 subscribers, and we've done that in less than five months. I never imagined in my wildest dreams that this could be possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, to commemorate this, I'm going to do a follow-up to one of my older videos, which covered a company called Blue Origin, which most of you are familiar with. And for those of you who watched that video, you'll remember that it was a fair, professional, and unbiased uh, review of this company and its accomplishments. And this video was entitled... <laughs> But since I made this video, I've had a chance to take a second look at Blue Origin. And they've been very busy. I mean, they still have their new Shepard rocket, which hasn't taken any passengers to orbit yet, and it's the only rocket that they've tested. Um, they've sent up, no, no, they haven't sent up any satellites or anything along those lines. Let's see here. Um, oh yeah, they've made a lot of friends with some of NASA's favorite companies. Yeah, they've formed lots of partnerships, and they're working very hard on their new Glenn rocket, which is a direct competitor to the Falcon Heavy which has been flying for two and a half years now or so. Um, let's see here. So, oh yeah, yeah, and they secured over 60% of the funding for researching and developing a lunar lander for Artemis. Somehow they managed to secure the lion's share of that money and they stand a very decent chance of securing that contract. And they have a philosophy that emphasizes moving at a snail's pace, step by step ferociously, as they call it, although it should be more like step by step very slowly. Uh, well, yeah, but you know what? Even though I said that these guys suck, you know, some time ago, I've grown in, in the time that I've been doing this, and I've broadened my horizons and, and gained perspective. And, uh, and you know what? Blue Origin still sucks. So thus far, after having been in existence for almost 20 years, longer than SpaceX actually, this is the sum total of what Blue Origin has managed to accomplish. Okay guys, look excited, you're not actually going into space, but uh, you need to kind of look like it. Yep, get buckled in, you're not actually, oh, and there's Uncle Bob, make sure that uh, Uncle Bob closes that door, be nice to him, because we're not paying him, you know, because Jeff Bezos doesn't pay taxes, so why should we pay him? Anyway, so here's the interior of our nice spacious capsule that uh, isn't going into orbit, by the way. 
And if you're wondering why I'm being so sarcastic, well, it's because Blue Origin has huge ambitions. I mean, they want to export all the heavy industry and all the destructive things that we do here on this planet into space and therefore save our environment. I mean, these are huge objectives. And yet, having been in existence for nearly two decades, as I said, this rocket, the New Shepard, is all they have to show for it. And it's not doing any of the things things that they are setting out to do. It's a space tourism rocket for suborbital operations, and that's it. Now, it does have complete reusability, which is a really nice feature. As a matter of fact, they pioneered this particular type of technology and then sued SpaceX, saying that they had exclusive rights to the patents. Well, if you're not going to do anything yourself, you may as well sue somebody else. But that's okay, because as everybody knows, Blue Origin has something brand new in the works. Well, they've actually had it in the works for a long, long time now, but something that's definitely going to put them into the fast lane when it comes to heavy lift capability. It's the new Glenn, as just about everybody knows. This thing can transport 45 metric tons to low Earth orbit, 13 metric tons to geosynchronous transfer orbit to the moon. This is what's going to be carrying their lunar lander set up all the way to the moon to complete the Artemis project. And uh, we've been watching this same simulated video over and over and over. Uh, we've seen some fairings, I guess, and, and uh, testing of their new engines. We've seen that a few times. Um, but uh, don't see any prototypes yet, and we're kind of running out of time. And um, oh, yeah, it's got reusability, which is really great. Yeah, it's going to be an excellent uh, competitor for the uh, for the Falcon Heavy. Yeah, it definitely will be at some point. You know what? Forget this. I am sick of watching things that are just theoretical. I mean, do we have something at least a little bit more promising? Well, actually, no, it gets worse. Yes, you got that right, worse, because the Blue Origin-led national team is providing the most wasteful aspect of the Artemis project that I've seen since the SLS. This little guy with the legs is the actual lander created by Blue Origin. And then these are the transfer elements created by Northrop Grumman based on their Cygnus-based resupply spacecraft. And this ascent element or little bubble-shaped ship which is provided by Lockheed Martin. So three companies, one spacecraft, oh yeah, and a fourth company, Draper, providing the avionics and the electronics. At least two private rocket launches will be required to get all of this together, and probably three. So the transfer element pushes the entire ship into a desired orbit for deployment, and then once that's done, there it goes, not to be reused, bye-bye transfer element, and the rest of the ship makes its way for a soft landing on the surface of the moon, or so the theory goes. So, here we go. Two companies left, Blue Origin providing the lander on the bottom, and then Lockheed Martin providing the ascent element on top. And so, after a week on the surface, the astronauts board the ascent element and then take off, making their way back to the Lunar Gateway or to the Orion, depending on the situation. And in the crowning irony, the Lockheed Martin portion of this ship is the only thing designed to be reusable. Absolutely ridiculous. So here's the solution proposed by the company that pioneered reusability. Every time you're going to want to put astronauts back on the moon, you're going to need a new lander, you're going to need a new transfer element. Essentially, you're going to need a whole new ship every single time. And therefore, at least one and probably two commercial launches in order to put astronauts back on the moon. I mean, how is this going to be feasible? If your intention is just to go to the moon once, great, but the Dragon XL was just contracted to resupply the Lunar Gateway to extend the amount of period that astronauts stay on the station. 
and you want your astronauts on the Lunar Gateway for as long as possible because it was designed to change its rectilinear halo orbit to differing locations, therefore allowing the astronauts to visit different spots on the Moon several times during the course of their visit. Now you can't do this if you have to send up a new lander and a new transfer element every time they want to go back to the Moon. So why the hell did NASA even consider this solution and give Blue Origin $579 million to do it? Why? Because it's the only solution? No, it isn't. Now, of course, everybody knows about the SpaceX Starship Lunar Lander solution. It's completely reusable and seems like a really good idea, but unfortunately, this design has received the lowest marks of all the proposals, and here's why. Firstly, NASA is concerned about the all new technologies that are being implemented, from propulsion using different engines than SpaceX has ever used before, to requiring an orbital refueling from a tanker starship in order to even get to the moon, along with other new technologies, but also the SpaceX proposal does not include a docking with the Lunar Gateway as a capability. Regardless of whether the Starship is actually capable of docking with a Gateway or not is irrelevant. The proposal does not include it, therefore it weakens their proposal considerably. And there are other issues. Something this tall and this slender might have a difficult time landing on a natural surface rather than a perfectly flat landing pad as SpaceX has used in the past. And in addition to this, something this big is going to require a fair amount of fuel. Where does this fuel come from? Do you have to build refueling stations on the moon? And how's that going to work in terms of deploying your astronauts to different spots on the surface? But the lander to receive the highest marks from NASA, both very good in technical and in the management categories, was the solution presented by the Dynetics Corporation, together with Sierra Nevada and a number of other partners. Now, unlike the other proposals, this ship can be deployed in a single launch, albeit by an SLS, which would be ridiculously expensive, but still, if you don't have an SLS, then you don't have Artemis, or it can be deployed in two segments by commercial launchers, namely the ULA Vulcan, which is partially reusable. So after picking up up to four astronauts from either the Orion or the Lunar Gateway, the lander descends to the lunar surface, ejecting the auxiliary fuel pods that it needs in order to make a soft landing. And then it descends to the lunar surface, not needing a transfer element or any other components. This is a single ship. Now, in my opinion, this squat, low-slung design is far better suited to land on an uneven surface. And then after a week's stay on the surface of the moon, the ship returns to the Lunar Gateway or to the Orion, being fully reusable except for the ejectable fuel pods. Now, personally, I agree with NASA's assessment of this lander. It's straightforward and simple. They only requested $253 million for the development, and it's almost completely reusable except for the fuel pods, and a smaller vessel like this would be far easier to refuel in lunar orbit than something like the Starship, and certainly a lot easier than getting all those components out for the Blue Origin solution. But there's an even better way to use this ship. Have the Lunar Starship bring it out to the Lunar Gateway. The Starship's cargo bay could easily accommodate both the lander and additional fuel pods, which if properly stored could save enough fuel for multiple visits to the lunar surface. Not only would this mean that SpaceX would no longer have to build a human-rated lunar starship since it would only be used for cargo purposes, they also would have enough fuel left after dropping off the lander and whatever other cargo they might have to return to Earth since they didn't actually land on the moon. 
And you wouldn't technically have to dock with the Lunar Gateway either. All you'd have to do is parallel its course, and then the Canadarm could unload whatever cargo the Starship had and the fuel pods for the Dynetics lander, as it made multiple visits to the lunar surface, scouting it out and finding an appropriate place to build a lunar base. Once this place was chosen, a 3D printer could be deployed to that location, a landing pad constructed, and then the lunar starship could land directly on the moon's surface, bringing the necessary cargo to build a base directly on the moon's surface. After being stuck with the expensive and wasteful SLS, it would be refreshing to have not one but two reusable vessels involved in establishing a permanent manned presence on the moon. A hell of a lot better than using more expendable and wasteful vessels as Blue Origin proposes to do. So why did NASA award almost $600 million to this wasteful, non-reusable solution? Was it the pressure applied by Jeff Bezos' new allies? Well, it's my personal hope that this poor decision led to Doug Lavero, the former head of NASA's human space flight, losing his job. But it could have been for a variety of other reasons. For example, choosing a wildcard like SpaceX instead of Boeing, especially since the SpaceX proposal did not include docking with the Lunar Gateway, which is a critical part of the Artemis mission, or for a variety of other reasons, any one of which could end up with Blue Origin being the anointed company for the Lunar Lander project. And if this happens, Artemis is in big trouble. The SLS has already put Artemis way behind and over budget, and then if you introduce another company that has a philosophy of moving very slowly and deliberately, it could put Artemis even further behind, and the further behind Artemis gets, the greater the chance is that Congress is simply going to cancel it. We cannot afford this. So look, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. Anybody who's seen my work knows that I am not a SpaceX fanboy by any stretch of the imagination. This wasn't pro-SpaceX and just slamming on Blue Origin for the fun of it. The fact of the matter is, is they've had so many years to develop a flourishing space program. They certainly have the funds to do it. And they have yet to send a single thing into orbit. And NASA may be entrusting them with the fate of the Artemis project because the SLS, as we already know, is horrifically behind and over budget. Can we really afford to risk having a second partner in this that's also going to be horribly behind? who has a philosophy that involves moving slowly when moving swiftly is what we absolutely have to be doing. And let me ask you something, Jeff, for the second time. Is there a Latin phrase for sense of urgency? Because you're sure as hell going to need it if you're going to be able to pull this off by 2024. And frankly, I don't think you can. And this puts Artemis in even greater danger. And that is why Blue Origin still sucks.